and so on. Okay, 15% discount on all drinks, uh, thanks to Timber. So if at any point you feel a little thirsty or nervous, uh, please help yourselves. All right, so uh, today we are in Game Changers. This is the first time we're doing this, and we hope that this is not going to be the last time. So with your support, I'm sure it won't be the last time. Uh, and I'm sure most of you know about me and Roland and uh, what we do, and that's why you were persuaded to pay 10 or $15 for a ticket to come. So uh, we'll just go through this briefly, uh, just in case some of you don't know, and then we'll start proper. OK, so this is about me. Uh, this is actually some slides from a pitch deck. So I have a pitch deck which I send to people so that you know, they can be persuaded to work with me and stuff. So treat this as uh, partly a PR lesson as well. Okay, so uh, I'm the first Singaporean to be managed by Universal in LA. I uh, live there half the time now and half the time back here in Asia. Next. Okay, here are my metrics. Metrics are very good to convince clients, by the way. So if you have uh, numbers like that, uh, the numbers don't lie, and you can use them to make yourself look quite impressive when you're trying to uh, you know, get clients and stuff. So here are my metrics. Next. And here are Roland's metrics. Uh, go, go for it. You want, you want to talk? No, it's all right. Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, then go back to your slide. <laughs> Never mind, mind. We need to give Roland some love as well. Uh, back, 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 back. Yeah. So, uh, Roland, like me, is also uh, kind of based in two locations. He has a studio in Perth where he works. He actually just flew back last night for this. So, he's, uh, yeah, but he's fresh and ready to go. He has a lot of number one and top ten hits as well. Next. Okay, so this is uh, something that uh, I'm very happy about. This is definitely one of the highlights of my year. Uh, being the first Singaporean to get a top five album on Billboard and the main chart and a number one in 55 countries, including the States, or Troy Sivan's Happy Little Pill. Since then, uh, I've been in the studio with a lot of people. That tends to happen once uh, you get a bit of a hit and then you know, people start wanting to work with you. So these are some of the people I've worked with. And for Roland, uh, he is the first Singaporean as well to break into the Australian major label rock metal scene. And these are some of the bands that he's worked with. Make Them Supper topped the iTunes charts and has been doing very well. And he's also working with this band called I Am Zero, which is under uh, UN Unified as well as Rise Records US, which is a pretty big deal. Next. Okay, some K-pop. Uh, managed to work on some cool K-pop over the years as well. Uh, so my ex are... Uh, mm, this guy from, from 2PM called Junho, uh, a new boy band for SM called Tasty, and some upcoming stuff with JYJ, Cho Yong Pil, and just between us, Super Junior. Okay, uh, Europe. Uh, got a couple hits this year as well. Uh, number one hit in Spain and number seven hit in Germany. You guys won't know because it doesn't come out, but just telling you. <laughs> All right, uh, currently working on JJ's next uh, 2015 concert tour as well, doing some arrangements for him. And in the past, been working for some of these lovely ladies you see on screen. Okay. And quite a few uh, recognizable C pop names as well Vanessa, Karen, Sho, Jeff, etc. Are made this year. Uh, with Singaporeans too, we have been uh, working quite hard. Uh, just recently, uh, Kelly has been making a very strong comeback. Uh, we're responsible for that. We're responsible for Derek as well, and for two of Joy Chua's recent number one hits in China. And uh, on the indie side, uh, Roland has been very proactive in nurturing, not just on the music side, but also on the business end as well. And these are some of his very uh, proud artists. They have all uh, topped or top 10 the Singapore iTunes charts. Okay, so this is a summary. We make hits for a living, and uh, we try to be as good at it as possible. So today we are going to try to share with you, just in a very brief three hours, how you can get there as well. Okay, so this is essentially, in a nutshell, what we're going to talk about today. We have uh, four aspects that need to happen before a hit is made and before you benefit from it as an artist or a producer. So let's look at the left-hand side first. First, we have creation. So in creation, it means writing and producing songs. Now, if you write and produce songs, you have to make sure that they are really awesome because otherwise the whole process doesn't work. All of these parts are so important. And if you look down at the bottom, the next set part is curation, which we're going to touch on as well today. How to choose the perfect singles to launch your own campaign. After that, uh, then we talk about promotion. 
how to launch your music, what do you do to generate the buzz so that you know, people don't just uh, you know, look at your music and walk away and you don't get anything out of it. So assuming you've done all of these things correctly, you're going to get some interest in your very awesome material, especially your hit singles. And that's when monetization happens. And we're going to tell you a little bit about how to monetize your stuff as well uh, using all of this. Uh, and then it, you know, it all goes full circle. A lot of artists stop at the top part because they don't get the monetization and then they feel uh, a bit discouraged and then their career dies and they move on to something else. But if this cycle is achieved, it can go on and on and you can get bigger and bigger in this cycle. Now, thankfully, uh, we have quite a supportive uh, government in recent years. And so you look at the top left-hand corner, we have grants. So grants, treat grants as seed money. They're there to provide additional support and to start off this chain. But don't rely on it as a given because sooner or later, this cycle will have to become self-sustaining. But this, in a nutshell, is what we're going to cover today uh, in this session, all of this stuff, as far as we can. Okay, so and then this is the overview. As you can see, it is very packed. We basically have about 15 to 20 minutes per topic. And then after that, it's going to be our, you know, a Q&A. Uh, and every 40 or 45 minutes, we're going to have a break. So for, if you see, at uh, 1720, 520, we're going to have a break. And then at 1800, we're going to have a special treat for you, performance by Ruby, who recently topped the iTunes charts here. And then uh, at 1900, which is 7 o'clock, we'll have a Q&A. And then from 7.30 onwards, we'll have networking. And more informal Q&As, I guess. Me and Roland will be sticking around, so feel free to say hi. OK, let's go. <laughs> Hit songwriting and arranging. OK, so um, you know, I was just thinking about things. I mean, preparing for these workshops is very good for me as well because you know, in my day-to-day -day life, I basically just churn, you know, like a machine. I just keep churning out music. So preparing for this workshop forced me to sit back and think. You know, what is it that is intuitive to me, but is um, may not be as intuitive to other people, and how to bring it across? So I thought about it, and then over one night, I think I distilled it down to two, these two elements, which are recall and resonance. Uh, let me explain. So recall is about remembering. So the main prerequisite of a hit is that people must remember it. If they don't remember it, it's not a hit. The second thing is that resonance. Okay, people may remember it, but do they feel it? Do they feel like it belongs to them? Do they feel connected to it? And so once you have something that everyone is forced to remember and that they also, to some extent, relate and connect to, it becomes a hit. Next. OK, so uh, all of this is very abstract, so don't worry. I'll illustrate later with a very uh, current song. Uh, but we have uh, four rules that I think are important for the production as well as the arrangement side of things. Uh, so these four rules are simplicity, strength, contrast, and context. Again, this is something I thought out over one like, night when I was really like, you know, trying to figure out what it is that makes my process tick. And so if you look at everything out there, uh, every pop song that is very successful, I mean, a lot of people make attempts. A lot of people will push material out and then realize that, oh, well, it, it doesn't stick. So for the stuff that sticks, which is in the top five or top 10 songs of the year, of the month, on the chart, whatever, I think that every, every time we listen to it, you realize that simplicity is a big thing. Like, for example, um, in the arrange on the arrangement side of things, you realize that really there are only no more than five to six elements, even at the biggest part of the song, the part where you're thinking like, wow, this is huge and it sounds epic. If you listen to it carefully, that epicness and hugeness can be distilled down to very clearly five or six elements tops. And nothing more than that. Why? Because as human beings, our attention spans are, sh uh, our attention spans are short and our brains can physically only process so many parts. As trained musicians, we could try to pick out more parts with some effort on our part. But remember that as a hit songwriter, a hit producer, or an artist, you're dealing with people that are not musically trained for the most part. So it must be as simple as possible. So that's on the arrangement end. On the melody end, you realize that most hits are extremely repetitive. Uh, and this is something that, you know, when I work with new writers, uh, et cetera, we'll often find, especially the very musically inclined ones, to be very keen on demonstrating their musicality, which is cool, but the, the problem is that what happens is they cram in enough material for five songs in one song, and then that doesn't work. 
So the idea of a pop hit is to distill everything down to these five or six simple elements, be it melodies or be it arrangements, and then just repeat over and over again. And that's what sticks. So lyrically, no big words. Melodically, repeat, sequence, everything. And then for arrangements, really limit your parts. Okay? And so simplicity comes with strength because let's face it, if you have a simple song with only so many elements, you have to expect it to be really good. Everything must be really perfect. It's like cooking seafood. If you have a piece of rotten fish, you will have to cover it with a lot of spices to make it taste good. But if you have a great piece of fish, you can just stick it in the oven and not even season it much and it will taste great. So that's the idea. Simplicity and strength have to come together. Every single idea, instrumentally or lyrically or melodically, has to be strong enough to stand on its own. Okay, uh, next uh, we talk about contrast. So, people like to be surprised. And even within your normal pop song rock format, which is like three, three and a half, four minutes tops, we want every 30 to 45 seconds to be exciting, to draw us out, to br bring us to a different place. So, this contrast, um, I will again demonstrate using a song later, but essentially it is about changing up a few things. Changing up the rhythm, changing up the pitch, or changing up the mood between sections. Or, occasionally, if you know what you're doing, you can throw a surprise, meaning change all three of them, go into a different space for 10 seconds, and then come back. That is, that is possible too. So, uh, rhythm, pitch, and mood. So, if we talk about rhythms, rhythms, so, for example, if you have a very rapid verse, you can have a very sparse chorus, meaning nothing much goes on, or vice versa. If you're pitch, pitch-wise, if you have a low verse, you can have a high chorus, or if you have a high verse, you have a low chorus. That's a simple way of, of, of putting it. Mood. Mood is very vague, but I guess, you know, for example, if you have no drums in the verses and a lot of drums in the chorus, that will immediately change the mood. So you can take that as one specific example of the general rule. Uh, surprise, uh, we'll, we can talk about that later as well. Okay, and the last thing that is, that in my opinion trumps all these rules is context. Because you must know what your audience is, what your target audience is, and what they like and dislike, what connects with them and what doesn't. In the end, this is the biggest determinant of whether your song will be a hit, whether you manage to connect with them in some meaningful way. It means nothing if you think your song is the greatest thing in the world, musically and lyrically, and you are writing a song for kids, say five-year-olds. That completely changes everything. Okay, so now let's, uh, let's watch a very interesting video, and then let's talk about it. <laughs> 